So part of your lab experience will be to do what we call the qual scheme. And the qual scheme is a qualitative analysis of ions where you'll be given an unknown solution of several different ions and you will have to do several different reactions to separate those ions and identify each ion that you removed. So an analytical scheme that utilizes selective precipitation to identify the ions present in the solution is called a qualitative analysis scheme and this requires wet chemistry techniques. During the qualitative analysis you'll be given a sample containing several ions and it's subjected to addition of several precipitating agents. And the addition of each reagent causes one of the ions to precipitate out. So as a representative here in this first test tube we've got three different cations A, B, and C. And you'll add a, a precipitating agent to it which will cause only one of the ions to precipitate. So in this one A was um, precipitated and that left everything else in solution so you can pour off the liquid that contains ions B and C and remove and you have the solid A left behind and you can add a new reagent and this new reagent will precipitate the next ion so in this one it precipitated cation B and left cation C in solution so you decant the liquid and you, this is how you can separate all the different ions in solution So this is kind of summary or an overview of a qual scheme where you've got many different metal ions and many different cations that can be identified. And the first step in this qual scheme, notice how we've kind of got these color coded because they kind of get separated out into groups. And then within these groups, you can separate the ions out with the other tests. But initially, if we have this big mixture of ions, if we add 6 molar HCl, you will precipitate the acid insoluble chlorides. This means that these metal ions have very poor solubility as a chloride salt. So you will precipitate out silver chloride, mercury chloride, and lead chloride, but the other ions will remain in solution. Then for the group 2 ions, you add hydrogen sulfide in an acidic solution and in under the acidic conditions the sulfide concentration is relatively low so this is how you separate out the group 2 these are the acid insoluble sulfides these precipitate out as sulfide complexes and these sulfide complexes have very poor solubility now after I've removed the group 1 and then I've removed the group 2, I can remove the group 3 ions, so aluminum through manganese, by increasing the pH of the solution. When I increase the pH of the solution, I still have the hydrogen sulfide in there. This increases the sulfide concentration. So if I increase the sulfide concentration, the group 3 ions will precipitate out. Now some of these will precipitate out as the sulfides and some will precipitate out as the hydroxides. Now you've still got a mixture of the group 4 and group 5 ions in solution. So after I remove the group 3 ions I can do another group separation test and this will separate out my group 4 as a precipitate and leave behind the group 5 ions in solution. And the group 5 ions can be identified by using a flame test. So the group 1 cations are silver, lead, and mercury, and all of these cations form compounds with chloride that are insoluble in water, as long as the concentration of the chloride salt is large enough. Now you have to be careful about the lead chloride, because notice the molar solubility of lead chloride is 1.43 times 10 to the minus second molar. It is more soluble than the silver or mercury chlorides. So the lead chloride will actually be more soluble than the silver and the mercury chlorides. So this is why sometimes the, the precipitation of the lead chloride isn't completely efficient. And you'll sometimes have some lead bleeding over into the group 2 and group 3 analysis. But these are all precipitated by the addition of hydrochloric acid. The group 2 cations contain cadmium, copper, bismuth, tin, arsenic, lead, antimony, and mercury. And all these cations form compounds with 
HS minus and S2 minus sulfides that are insoluble in water at low pH and they're precipitated by the addition of hydrogen sulfide in HCl. So notice if we've got hydrogen sulfide and it establishes its equilibrium. So 2H plus plus S2 minus. At low pH, so at low pH, you have a high H plus concentration. So a high H plus concentration, if you increase the the hydronium ion concentration by lowering the pH it's going to shift the equilibrium to the left and so that lowers that concentration of the sulfide minus. So you have a low concentration in the group 2 situation. So these are just some pictures of those precipitated products. Now the group 3 ions are iron, cobalt, zinc, manganese, nickel, as well as the chromium, iron, and aluminum but those are precipitated as the hydroxides. All these cations form compounds with sulfide that are insoluble in water at high pH. So going back to that hydrogen sulfide equilibrium, at high pH you have a low H plus concentration. So if you drop that concentration of the H plus down by adding a base, that shifts the equilibrium to the right, which causes the sulfide concentration to increase. But also, too, since you're adding a base to bring the sulfide concentration up, you're increasing the hydroxide ions, and some of those hydroxides can bind to the metals as well. And this is why the chromium, iron, and aluminum precipitate out as the hydroxides. The group 4 cations are magnesium, calcium, and barium. All these cations form compounds with phosphate that are insoluble in water at high pH. And the group 5 cations are sodium, potassium, and ammonium. All these cations form compounds that are soluble in water and they do not precipitate. And they're going to be identified by the color of their flame. So sodium produces a nice yellow flame. Potassium produces this blue-purple flame. So here we're going to be looking at our last type of equilibrium constant. This will be the complex ion formation. Transition metals tend to be good Lewis acids. And a good Lewis acid means that they're a good lone pair acceptor. Transition metals often bond to one or more water molecules to form a hydrated ion. Water is the Lewis base. It donates electron pairs to form the coordinate covalent bond. Here in this example we're looking at silver. Silver, when dissolved in water, is not naked. So silver will actually bind to two water molecules. So if I draw out that silver and draw the Lewis dot structure of water, so the water molecule has two lone pairs. Imagine one of those lone pairs donating its electrons to the silver. This forms a coordinate covalent bond. And the silver can actually bind another water molecule. So it forms this linear type complex. Ions that form by combining a cation with several anions or neutral molecules are called complex ions. Ion just means that it has a charge and complex simply means that you have a metal with ligands attached to it. And the ligands are the anions or neutral molecules that are actually bound to the metal. So these attached ions or molecules are called ligands. Now I know sometimes you hear these, this term in biology. People mispronounce it as ligands. It is not called a ligand. It is a ligand. This is an inorganic chemistry term. We get to say how it's pronounced. And I'm an inorganic chemist. And it is a, pronounced as a ligand. You will offend many coordination chemists if you pronounce this as a ligand. Think about this being very similar to ligament. When you're talking about the body. So that ligand 
is the same pronunciation. These are ligands. Water is a common example of a ligand. If a ligand is added to a solution that forms a stronger bond than the current ligand, it will replace the current ligand. For example, silver when bound to the water molecules, if it's exposed to the amine, the amine will replace the water molecules. And this tells me that the silver amine complex has a higher formation constant, it has a higher equilibrium constant than does the formation of the silver aqueous complex. Now generally we don't include water since its complex ion is always present in aqueous solutions. So a lot of times we'll leave that out because it's kind of understood. So these two representations are the exact same thing. The bottom one is just a simplified version of the top where we don't show the water. The reaction between a metal cation and ligands to form a complex is called a complex formation reaction. So here we have a silver ion dissolved in water exposed to two equivalents of amine and it will form this amine complex. So the silver Think of the nitrogen so that mean has the lone pair. It will donate those lone pairs to the silver. To form those bonds. So this entire species here this is the complex. It has two ligands attached to it to form the complex. And this would actually be a complex ion because this, ion, this complex has a charge. It has an overall plus one charge. Each amine is neutral. The silver has a plus one charge, so the overall charge is plus one. And the equilibrium constant for the formation reaction is called the formation constant. So again, capital K just means equilibrium constant. The F just means it's the formation. So you're combining things to form a complex. The mass action equation for our formation constant for the silver combining with ammonia. So our products, our product is the silver complex over the reactants of the silver concentration times the ammonia concentration squared. And again, like many other equilibrium constants, you will find a table in your book of formation constants. And the larger the formation constant, the more favored the formation. So the more likely that complex is to form. Okay, in this example problem, we're given that 200 mils of a 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3rd molar copper nitrate solution is mixed with 250 mils of 0.2 molar ammonia. They want to know what's the copper concentration at equilibrium. So I'm going to write my formation constant reaction. So the copper plus ammonia forming the copper tetraamine complex. I have to make sure I balance the chemical equation. So for every four ammonias, I'm going to need four amines. And the copper to copper complex is a one to one mole ratio. So my complex, so my reaction is completely balanced. I set up my mass action equation, my products over my reactants, and I don't forget my exponents. So since I have a four in front of the ammonia, I have to raise it to the fourth power. And I can look up in a table the and the KF for the copper mean complex is 1.7 times 10 to the 13th. And if you'll remember in lab, as part of the introduction to equilibria, you actually made this complex when you added the ammonium hydroxide to the copper solution. Now before I can get started with my mass action equation, I have to find my initial concentrations because remember, in this problem, I start off with 200 mils of this 1.5 times 10 to the minus third molar copper nitrate, and I mixed it with 250 mils of the 0.2 molar ammonia. When I combined these two solutions, I diluted the ammonia and I diluted the copper nitrate. So I have to find the new initial concentrations. So to find the copper concentration, 
I take the molarity, multiply it by the volume of the copper to determine the number of moles of copper. The moles of copper then divided by the total volume of the solution. So this is this denominator here. This is the total volume of the solution. This gives me the copper concentration initially. I need to do the same thing with the ammonia because ammonia was diluted as well. I started off with 0.25 liters, so this is the 250 mils of the ammonia, times the molarity to give the number of moles of ammonia. Those number of moles of ammonia divided by the total volume give me the new initial concentration of the NH3. So I now have the NH3 concentration initial and I have the initial copper 2 plus concentration. Now I can begin setting up my ice table. As I can begin setting up my ice table I've got to start off with my initial concentration of the copper and ammonia. So this is where these initial values came from. This is where I calculated from the dilution. And the Kf for the copper mean complex, and remember, is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 13th. Because this is such a large number, we're going to assume that pretty much everything has gone to make the copper complex. So we just say this reaction lies very far to the right. So if we start off with some copper, since it lies so far to the right, we're going to assume that basically almost all of the copper complex gets converted into the copper amine. So the change is roughly 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4. So we're going to say just about almost all, but that little bit left over that's different is x. The ammonia change is four times that amount. Because remember, this is a 1 to 4 mole ratio. And the copper ratio to copper mean complex is a 1 to 1. So here these were minus values. This has to be plus values on this side. Now here because we're, this is an x value and this is kind of like x value we're going to say this is this x value this 4 times this is very small relative to the 0 0.11 within the sig figs. So our equilibrium values are x for the copper 2 plus 0.11 for the ammonia and 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4th for the copper amine. Okay, now that I've done my ice table, I can start plugging into my mass action equation. So I've just cleaned things up and moved things around so I can still show you what I'm doing here. So this is my same mass action equation as before. I plug in my equilibrium values, so my products over my reactants. I can't forget raising this to the fourth power. And I get an x value of 2.7 times 10 to the minus 13th. Now because 2.7 times 10 to the minus 13th is so much, much smaller than 6.7 times 10 to the minus 4th, this approximation is valid. So this is the concentration of the copper 2 plus, so this free copper in solution. That's the concentration of it when in the presence of the ammonia to form the amine complex. Let's look at the effect of the complex ion formation on solubility. The solubility of an ionic compound that contains a metal cation that forms a complex ion increases in the presence of aqueous ligands. So this is actually a reaction that you'll be doing as part of your qual scheme for the group 1 ions. We're looking at this overall reaction of adding ammonia to a mixture of silver chloride. And what happens is, as you add the ammonia, the ammonia will start to dissolve some of the silver ions as you form the silver amine complex. So as you add the ammonia to the silver chloride solid in, in water, this will increase the solubility of the the silver and it forms the silver ammonia complex so you actually get a solution. So what's happening is remember the silver ion was precipitated by adding HCl and it precipitates because the solubility product for this is so low. So this has a very small value 
So the silver chloride is very insoluble. So the silver chloride will precipitate out in solution. But if I add some ammonia to it, ammonia and silver form the silver amine complex and it has a large formation constant, so 10 to the seventh. So what happens is that as you add ammonia, as you increase ammonium concentration, the reaction will shift to the right. So as it shifts to the right, the concentration of silver will go down. Well, if the silver concentration goes down, then it goes down in this system too. Well, the silver chloride will, that's in the solid form, will then shift to replace that silver that's lost. So you get more of the silver chloride dissolving into solution. So adding ammonia to a solution in equilibrium with silver chloride increases the solubility of the silver ion. Now let's talk about the solubility of amphoteric metal hydroxides. Many metal hydroxides are insoluble. All metal hydroxides become more soluble in acidic solution. This shifts the equilibrium to the right by removing the hydroxide ion. Some metal hydroxides also become more soluble in basic solution. They act as a Lewis base forming a complex ion. Substances that behave as both an acid and a base are said to be amphoteric. Some cations that form amphoteric hydroxides include aluminum, chromium, zinc, lead, and antimony. Aluminum 3 plus is hydrated in water to form an acidic solution. So remember aluminum 3 plus that is a highly charged metal ion and we said that highly charged metal ions when dissolved in water will produce an acidic solution because as the waters are bound to the aluminum it pulls electron density in and it's more likely for the proton to be released. So this is where we're showing the hydroxide being formed on the aluminum because one of the water molecules gave up its proton. So this is how we get an acidic solution. Addition of hydroxides drives the equilibrium to the right and continues to remove hydrogens from the molecules. So if we add hydroxide, so we add hydroxide ions, they will react with the hydronium ions because they're going to neutralize each other. This is going to cause the hydronium ions concentration to go down. The equilibrium will shift to the right to compensate for it. And as you add hydroxides to it, it will continue to deprotonate the other water molecules on the aluminum. So in this first reaction here, where we, still, where we have one hydroxide ion on the aluminum, you add another equivalent of hydroxide, you'll remove another proton from the water, and now we have two hydroxides on the aluminum. If you add another equivalent of hydroxide, we will remove another proton from the aluminum, so now we go from two hydroxides to three hydroxides. So the hydroxides are removing the protons from the water bound to the aluminum. So if we're looking at the aluminum 3 plus ion in water at acidic pH conditions, all the hydroxides are going to be completely broken so we form the water. So going back to this original reaction, at acidic pH we have a high H plus concentration. Well, that pushes the equilibrium to the left, so we have the aluminum in the form of the aluminum with six waters bound to it, and it's a three plus charge. But as we start increasing the pH, increasing the pH, those hydroxide ions are going to start to remove protons from the water onto the aluminum. And so at neutral pH, you have aluminum trihydroxide, so you, the aluminum has three water molecules bound to it and three hydroxides. So this is the species that we looked at here. But if we keep increasing the pH and we keep adding more and more hydroxides, we can remove more and more protons from the waters bound to the aluminum. And at basic pHs, you get the aluminum in the form of aluminum with two waters and four hydroxide ions. So this right here would be two of the water molecules and these at these positions would be the hydroxide ions. 
So notice that higher pHs, where you've got more hydroxides in solution, you're more likely to have hydroxides bound to the aluminum. But at lower pHs, where you have lots of protons, those protons are going to protonate those hydroxides on the aluminum, and you're going to have waters bound to the aluminum. So depending upon the pH is what kind of aluminum complex that you have in solution.